Afternoon committee, welcome, and uh, we will come to order and begin our committee with bill introductions. Do we have any bill introductions? Ms. Colombo. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I'm Rochelle Colombo. I'm the executive director of the Kansas Medical Society, and I'm here to request bill introduction of RS-887. It is a bill dealing with medical malpractice um, insurance and would increase um, the minimum coverage requirements as well as the policies that are able to be offered by the Healthcare Stabilization Fund. I'm happy to stand for questions. Thank you, committee. Are there any questions? Is there any objection to the bill introduction? With have a question, Representative? I was just going to make a move. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I appreciate the motion, but without objection, we will, uh, the bill will be introduced. So, thank you. Thank you. Further bill introductions is uh, Mr. Klump on the WebEx. I am, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The floor is yours. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I am here today. My name is Ed Klump. I am representing the Kansas Sheriff's Association. We have a bill request to make 21RS0769. This is a bill that was um, passed out of the Senate uh, committee uh, in 2019 that allows a local option for those counties where the sheriff's deputies are already in KPNF to allow their corrections officers to also be in KPNF. Thank you, committee. Any questions on RS769, I believe, was our number? That's correct. Seeing no questions, is there any objection to the introduction? And without introduction, the bill will be introduced. Thank you, Mr. Klump. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee. Further bill introductions? Seeing none, we will move to uh, our next item of business, which would be uh, action on bills previously heard. And uh, Mr. Think, Chairman, this is Gail Finney. Yes, sorry. Finney. Well, I have a bill introduction. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry I have my Mr. hand up. Representative Philly. Finney. Oh, Philly. <laughs> um, I have an RS number. The RS number is 0421. And what it is, it's a breast diagnostics bill. Well, we're trying to get the state of Kansas to uh, pay that part of the co-share. Uh, what it is, is um, when a woman has a mammogram and if her breast has a lot of density in it and it needs further follow-up, then they have to go through what they call a breast diagnostic exams. And currently the state of Kansas, uh, they have to pay that out of their personal pocket or their co-pay. And so this bill is asking to change that. Thank you. Committee, any questions for Representative Finney? Is there an objection to the introduction? And what's that? And without objection, the bill is introduced. Thank you, Representative. Thank you. So, uh, are there any other bill introductions that I may have missed? Hearing none, we will proceed to our next item of business, which will be to work a few of the bills that we had, one of them related to the uh, KPNF death benefit, which would be 2063. And uh, just to get everybody on the same page, I might ask if Reviser Weiss is on the line and can give us an overview of the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, House Bill 2063, this is the bill that dealt with the, uh, the KPNF Tier 2 member spouse and uh, the children's benefits if a member uh, died from a uh, service-connected disability prior to uh, reaching uh, normal retirement age. Uh, under current law, there's no distinction between the service-connected and non-service-connected in, in these cases. Um, if a member dies, um, disabled member dies now, the member spouse receives the 50 uh, lump sum payment equal to 50% of the member's final average salary and a monthly benefit equal to 50% of the uh, disability benefits. Um, uh, what HB 2063 would provide is that on and after July 1, 2019, if it is service connected, uh, the member spouse would receive a um, e um, benefit equal to 50% of the member's final average salary 
or if the member had no dependents, the retirement the, the retirement benefit that the member would have been entitled to, whichever is greater. Um, the bill also provides that if um, the member has a children under the age of 18 or under age 23, if the, the child is a full-time student, uh, each child would receive an annual benefit equal to 10% of the member's final average salary until such time the child would turn 18 or 23 in the case of those uh, full-time students. Uh, the total combined uh, spousal and children's benefits under this bill would uh, shall not exceed 75% of the member's final average salary. And uh, I can uh, stand for any questions. Thank you. Questions for the, for the reviser? Representative Riley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I didn't have a specific question, but I was waiting for a, possibly a balloon amendment to this. So tell me when that's appropriate. Certainly. Thank you. We'll start if there are any questions for the reviser, uh, just to make sure we get those covered. Do we have any from the other room showing a hand? Um, Representative Proctor, do you have a question for the reviser or are you ready with an amendment? Mr. Chair, I, I have an amendment if the reviser could uh, distribute the, the balloon amendment. Um, so uh, committee and uh, chair, this uh, is a very simple amendment. Um, all it does is uh, change the name of the bill uh, or name the bill, uh, the Michael Wells Memorial Act uh, in honor of the husband of Miss Angela Wells who had testified uh, during the hearing on the bill. I think we were all moved by her testimony and I'd like uh, him to be memorialized in this uh, bill. So. So thank you for explaining that, Representative. It looks like we have a couple of places where the, the language is added, and that is the sum total of the balloon. Yes, Mr. Chair. Great. Um, so we're, we'll, we'll roll with it from here. Um, there's a couple of ways that we can proceed if anyone wants to move that we pass 2063 favorable and move to the amendment, or I'll accept the Senate version of working the bill if you wish to start by moving the amendment to 2063. And uh, we will continue with debate, assuming that no one waves their hands and says they have a question for the reviser before we uh, get into the debate. Thank you, Mr. Seeing Chair. That, I move. Yes. I move the amendment. A uh, motion by Representative Proctor to amend. Second by Representative Miller. No? So, okay. Um, seconded by Representative Garber. Uh, question from Representative Miller. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. As I would always on this type of amendment, have we cleared it with the family that this is something they desire? So, thank you. Uh, Representative Proctor, do you have an answer for that? Um, I do. The uh, uh, I'm I'm drawing a blank on the name, but the the gentleman from uh, the fire department that uh, testified on the bill uh, spoke to Miss Wells uh, before he made this suggestion uh, to to me. Was that a yes or a no? I wasn't sure. That's a that's a yes. Thank you, Representative Miller. It was a question that I asked also. I did not ask Mrs. Wells, but I did also ask the uh, firefighter who testified who assured me that they would like that uh, to be named and memorialized. So Thank great you. point to check on. Thank you. Uh, further questions or discussion on the motion to amend? Seeing none, Representative Proctor, you may close. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I uh, move that the amendment be adopted. Thank you. You've heard the motion by Representative Proctor to amend. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Close nay. Ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. Thank you. The amendment is passed. Um, further discussion? Representative Riley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm hoping the reviser will bring forward a balloon amendment that I have that I'd like to bring forward. Basically, it backs up one year to January 1st, 2018. Is that correct, Alan? 17, 2017. And we have uh, Alan's uh, 
hardworking folks have done a lot of research. They spent a whole night working on this to make sure that would be an appropriate date, going back and checking death certificates, checking that there would only be, there, there's basically gonna be one more family that would be reached underneath this amendment that would get the same benefits as the, the folks from 2018. So I am open for questions and I think I some of this I would wave to Alan if he needs uh, further discussion. So that was my motion from uh, this balloon amendment. Second. So motion by Representative Riley to amend, seconded by Representative Miller. Discussion committee. So I, I will weigh in on this, and I think it can go either direction. Uh, as I mentioned with Representative Riley before, I am not as likely to change the date. I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. Uh, I appreciate that the director happened to go back to 17 and find that there is one more case that was there. But the question that I have is what if we would have gone to 16 and, and found one in say September of 16, would that be the right place? And I'm not pretending that there's a right or wrong, uh, but I would probably stick with the date that was in the bill originally, not knowing if there are other things that come up. Uh, however, I do appreciate and agree with the maker of the motion that uh, if you can address justice, that's a good thing. It's just that I don't always know what else is behind that initial motion. So any further uh, questions or discussion, Representative Neighbor? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, do we have a physical note on that or um, if, is it going to have a, a large impact on the uh, cost of the bill? Director Conroy, do you have that or Representative Riley? Either one. Uh, Mr. Chair, I was just going to waive part of my time to Alan for him to follow up on that, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I don't believe it would it would not materially impact uh, the fiscal note. It's already carried out to the second decimal point, which is uh, in terms of actuarial analysis, because they, every year they look at demographics and everything. There's lots of moving parts there. So um, I think the original fiscal note uh, between the prior cost and the future cost, you know, it was $222,000 to make that change at least for the first one and then going forward and that's spread over 112 uh, employers um, and over a salary base of about a little over a half billion dollars. So um, uh, it's, it'd be very minimal um, and I don't believe it would move the actuarial needle from what's already been provided. Thank you and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Further questions or discussion? Representative Riley. And Mr. Chair, well, Ellen is still stand, standing up. I think you did do some research, or your group did do some research further back, correct? Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's correct. We did do some spot checking, sort of going back through those death certificates. Um, uh, there were maybe one or two others. And again, the farther you go back, the more limited the information is. Uh, but it appeared that um, just the way the the situation was uh, these individuals were better off under the current provisions than they would be uh, under this provision. It, it gets, if there's not a surviving spouse and there's dependents and so forth. Um, um, so anyway, uh, it wasn't an exhaustive search, but we did uh, spot check going back even further than the five years. Thank you. Further questions or discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, Representative Riley, you may close. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to move my motion of changing this date to this amendment. Thank you. Thank you. You've heard the motion by Representative to Riley to amend. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Opposed, nay. Ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. Motion passed. The amendment passes. That puts us back on the bill. Uh, further discussion on the bill. Representative Neighbor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would move that we pass House Bill 2063 as amended out favorably. Thank you. Do I have a second?
Representative Riley. I probably have some in the other room if I was able. The screen is up clearly now. I see Representative Proctor. Also, I did call Representative Riley as the second, but I'll keep an eye out. So thanks for staying in the game with us. Um, is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, and while we may not need it, uh, Representative Bishop, would you close? Representative Neighbor. Neighbor. I'm so sorry. <laughs> thank you, Representative. I am messing up. I can't say things right, so thank you for correcting me, I've Representative had that Neighbor. I apologize. All day today. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. When the committee rises and reports, I hope that it reports uh, House Bill 2063 out favorably as amended for passage. Thank you, Representative Neighbor. You have heard the motion by Representative Neighbor to pass 2063 favorable as amended. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. <laughs> Ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. Thank you. Uh, that takes care of 2063, and thanks for your help on that particular bill. We'll now turn our attention to the drop extension bill, which is 2064, and might ask Mr. Weiss to again get us on the same page with an overview of the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, House Bill 2064. This is the bill that concerns the, uh, the drop uh, program. This would allow a member of the drop uh, previously elected a drop period of less than five years to revoke such election and extend uh, the member's drop uh, period by making application to the retirement system. The total aggregate drop period for a member would remain at five years from the effective date of the member's initial election to participate in drop. Uh, under current law, a drop member makes a one-time irrevocable election to participate in, in drop for a minimum of three years and a maximum of five. So this would allow somebody that has that three-year drop to extend all the, to extend to a total of five years, but it still remains capped at, at the five-year um, drop period. Thank you, Reviser. Are there any questions for the Reviser on the bill? Representative Berquist, if you keep us clued in, we don't hear it. We don't see your room until some sound is made over there and you pop up on the screen. So you're entirely too well behaved. Um, but if there are no questions, I would welcome a motion. And just to go through the motions, if anyone wished to make it, uh, the initial motion would typically be that I would move that we pass 2064 favorable for passage. And if anyone wishes to make that motion, uh, if you want to cue the mic in the other room, I would be glad to recognize you. We'll, we'll go in this room with Representative Neighbor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move that uh, when the... Uh, I move that we pass out House Bill 2064 favorable for passage. Motion by Representative Neighbor, seconded by Representative Riley. Thank you. Any, any discussion on the motion? With no discussion, Representative Neighbor, you may close. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think this is a wonderful opportunity for those to be able to expand uh, their first decision-making power. And so with that, I move that uh, the committee pass out House Bill 2064 favorable for passage. Thank you, Representative. You've heard the motion by Representative Neighbor that I won't restate since we just said it twice. Uh, all of those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it, and the bill is passed. Uh, committee will take up one more bill today, and this would deal with producer licensing and would be Bill 2074. Um, with that, uh, Reviser Weiss, I don't know if you're still up or if Reviser Ma is able to be with us yet to go over the insurance licensing bill. Uh, Mr. Chair, I am actually here, but I just got here. So, David, if you want to go ahead and do that one, I'm getting ready for bill briefs. Thank you. Certainly. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Yes, uh, 2074, this is the bill. You might remember that um, amended portions of the Uniform Insurance Agents Licensing Act, as long, along with the Public Adjusters Licensing Act. There's also an amendment to uh, KSA 40, 241 pertaining to examination of applicants 
for a licensure as an insurance agent. Um, this, if you remember, the, a lot of the uh, amendments here dealt with uh, continuing education courses for uh, for agents and uh, public adjusters. Um, the first uh, the first section for uh, forty dash two forty one uh, is the examination for individual applicants for agent uh, licenses. Under current law, if an individual fails to pass the licensure examination, the individual may retake the examination. Following a waiting period of not less than uh, seven days, that would be the second try. Uh, if they again fail, they may retake the examination following another waiting period, not less than seven days, that would be the third try. And then if they again fail, they would have a uh, waiting period of not less than six months for a fourth try. Um, if the applicant fails that fourth try, they would have to be, they would have to wait two years and then before, and then the examination and cycle would re, uh, reset itself. What a House Bill 2074 does is strike that six month waiting and the two year waiting periods before the applicant would be allowed to retake a failed examination and allow an applicant to retake that examination after a waiting period of not less than seven days. So it just shortens that 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 reset of the of the examination period. Uh, section two this starts the uh, amendments to the Uniform Insurance Licensing Act. The uh, substantive amendment was a definition of biannual due date. It specifies that that is the last day of the birth month of a license agent required to complete the CECs and the last day of the month of the date of the initial licensure for registered business entity. Uh, section three um, adds some new language that would require an insurance agent to pay, to pay a biannual renewal application fee of $4 and apply for renewal on a form prescribed by the commissioner. The number of CECs Required for renewal has also been changed. Uh, current law requires a licensed insurance agent who is an individual and holds a property ca or casualty qualification or both a or a personal lines qualification to earn a minimum of 12 CECs and courses certified as property and casualty. That include at least one hour in ethics. <clears throat> the bill also would amend uh, current law to require that on and after January 1, 2022, uh, with certain exceptions. Uh, a licensed insurance agent would be required to earn 18 CECs and include at least three hours of ethics and may include regulatory compliance. Uh, section four uh, pertains to applications for uh, insurance licensure. Uh, amendments to this section uh, relate to disclosures made by licensed persons to the uh, commissioner. On uh, page, if you look at pages 13 and 14 of the bill, the number of items have been added relating to disciplinary actions. On a licensee's, a, uh, licensee's license or criminal history and changes in the information that the entity uh, or person must report within 30 days of the occurrence of such actions. Uh, Section 5 uh, pertains to commissioner's powers to deny an application or suspend, revoke, or refuse a license. Um, the bill adds a list of failure to respond to an inquiry from the commissioner within 15 business days. The bill also adds a number of items the commissioner shall take into consideration when deciding to grant or renew a license. Um, section six pertains to appointment of agents. Under current law, certification of a of other than a licensed insurance agent will automatically include each licensed agent who is an officer, director, partner, or employee associated with the uh, corporation, association, or partnership. Uh, effective January 1, 2022, the bill would remove that requirement that these individuals be certified and required to pay the associated certification fee. Uh, Section 7 uh, pertains to renewal of insurance agent licenses. The amendment to the statute would allow the commissioner to spend the agent's license for 90 days if the agent does not apply for renewal by the agent's biannual due date and assessment and the assessment of a $100 penalty for each license suspended. If the agent fails to apply for renewal after 90 days but before 12 months the agent and the agent wishes to reinstate the license, the agent would be required to pay a reinstatement fee of $100 per license. If after 12 months have passed, the agent wishes to re reinstate the license, uh, the agent will have to submit proof of the uh, those CEC completions and pay a reinstatement fee. Uh, section eight, this pertains to the uh, public adjuster's licenses. This uh, amendment to the statute would grant the commissioner authority to require the applicant for the public adjuster license to be fingerprinted and submit to a uh, state and national criminal history record check at the applicant's expense. Uh, section nine uh, pertains to continuing education credit uh, credits for uh, public adjuster licensees. The amendment here has been uh, to make the definition of biannual due date 
and to require CEC requirement to be consistent with changes made to the insurance agents licensing act that was made in, earlier in the bill. It was those 18 uh, CEC hours. I think that is the, uh, the bulk of the bill, Mr. Chairman, but I can stand for any questions. For the overview committee questions. This is a great chance for us to test Reviser Weiss's depth on the insurance bills. Seeing no questions, thank you for the overview. <laughs> With that committee, what are the wishes on House Bill 2074? Representative Croft. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I, I move uh, the committee pass favorably House Bill 2074. Thank you, motion by Representative Croft. Second. There a second. Second. Seconded by Representative Riley. I may have heard one in the other room, but I'm still not seeing anyone there. So uh, I apologize for that if there was. So with that discussion committee, if there is no further discussion, would you quickly check online and in the other room for us? If there is no further discussion, Representative Croft, you may close. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I close. Uh, you've heard the motion by Representative Croft to pass House Bill 2074 favorable. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed aye. nay. The ayes appear to have it. I'm sorry that I jumped on one of our ayes online, but I appreciate uh, each of the votes. The ayes appear to have it, and the ayes do have it. The bill is passed. Thank you, committee. Uh, we'll pick up our work on other bills uh, on our next meeting, but I will move at this point to our first hearing, which would be House Bill 2135. And if we may start with an overview from the reviser. Thank you, Mr. Chair. House Bill 2135 amends KSA 75-3036 and 77-547 and KSA 2020 SUP 17-12A508, 17-12A601 and 17-12A609, establishing the Securities Act Victim Restitution Program and the Securities Act Victim Restitution Fund. Uh, section one of the bill amends KSA 2020 SUP 17-12A508, pertaining to criminal penalties and the statute of limitations for intentional violations of the Kansas Uniform Securities Act. Under current law, no prosecution for an intentional violation may commence more than 10 years after the alleged violation um, if the victim is the Kansas Public Ret Employees Retirement System or CAPERS. Prosecution for any other intentional violation of the Kansas Uniform Securities Act may not commence more than five years after the alleged violation. Senate Bill 30 would strike that five-year statu statute of limitations and make the statute of limitations a uniform 10 years for all intentional violations of the Kansas Uniform Securities Act. Section 2 amends KSA 77-547 pertaining to the identification of agency head or administrator for purposes of administrative hearings or proceedings rather under the Kansas Administrative Procedure Act or CAPA. Under current law, for purposes of administrative hearings for the insurance department under CAPA, the agency head is the commissioner of insurance or the assistant commissioner of insurance when acting on the commissioner's behalf. The bill would identify the securities commissioner or the assistant commissioner of insurance as the administrator for purposes of administrative hearings for the office of securities commissioner under CAPA. Section 3 amends KSA 2020 SUP 17-12A601 by creating a Securities Act Victim Restitution Program, creating the fund from which restitution assistance is paid, and detailing the specifics of the program. The Securities Act Victim Restitution Program's purpose is to provide restitution assistance to victims of securities violations who were awarded restitution as the result of a legal or administrative action for violations of the Kansas Uniform Securities Act, but who have no reasonable likelihood of receiving the full amount of the awarded restitution. The bill states that a claimant must apply for restitution assistance and that the administrator must receive the claimant's application no later than two years after the date of the final order. 
the administrator would have sole discretion in granting any award of restitution assistance in whole or in part to a claimant. To receive restitution assistance, a claimant must demonstrate eligibility for such assistance, file a timely application with the administrator, and the administrator must determine that there is no reasonable likelihood that the claimant will receive the full amount of restitution awarded by the final order. Restitution assistance would be limited to the, le excuse me, to the lesser of either $25,000 or 25% of the amount of the restitution awarded in the final order, excluding any interest awarded that remains unpaid at the time the administrator awards the restitution assistance. If the victim is a vulnerable person, the maximum amount of restitution assistance would double to the lesser of either $50,000 or 50% of the amount of restitution awarded in the final order, again, excluding any interest awarded that remains unpaid at the time the administrator awards such restitution assistance. Section 4 amends KSA 17-12A609 to state that a final order of the administrator is sub is not subject to, to I'm sorry that a final order of the administrator is subject to judicial review except for those determinations pertaining to the Kansas uh, sorry to the Securities Act Victim Restitution Program Fund and applications for assistance. And Section 5 amends KSA 75-3036 to add the Securities Act Victim Restitution Fund to the list of funds that are statutorily required to be used for the purpose set forth and for no other governmental purpose. And with that, Mr. Chair, I can stand for questions. Thank you. Committee questions? Representative Dodson. Mr. Chairman, this is Representative Howe. Representative Howe, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in the bill brief, it says the administrator shall have the sole, um, I guess, authority to uh, award the restitution uh, to the claimant. Uh, it also, would that be in this case, the uh, insurance commissioner or the acting, in, uh, acting insurance commissioner or assistant insurance commissioner? Um, in the case, in the case of the of this program, the administrator is actually the commissioner. Okay, uh, thank you. Do we have an assistant insurance commissioner? Um, I actually don't know that for sure. Um, Lee, who's probably there and going to testify shortly, can probably answer the question. Thank you. Thank you. Further questions, Representative Howe? No, thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Representative Dodson. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first of all, do we have some idea of how many of these occur per year? And uh, I guess, moreover, can you give an example of some of these uh, violations? Um, Representative, I can talk to you about the legal portion of the bill and those questions about the program and the details would probably be better addressed by the country from the department. Thank you very much. Thank you, Representative. Other questions for the reviser on the, on the bill? Seeing none. Thank you for the overview and we'll come back as we have questions through the rest of the discussion. Um, I might take just a moment if research is available to walk us through the fiscal note. It's pretty obvious, but uh, might take that moment. Uh, thank you, Chairman Johnson. Committee members, as Eileen stated, the bill does require on July 1st, 2021, that $250,000 be transferred from the Securities Act fee fund to the Securities Act Victim Restitution Fund. And this does have a resulting impact on the state general fund. And so this would, um, each year the department would now be required to, by statute, transfer any excess balance over $50,000 of the Securities Act fee fund to the general fund. And with this change in the bill, the general fund would see a decrease in revenues of $250,000 in fiscal year 2022. 
Uh, the department did state uh, to represent Dodson's question and they can provide additional testimony. The amount of restitution created by the bill cannot be estimated because the amount awarded and the amount uncollected by victims at present is unknown. But they do estimate restitution payments would be less than $200,000 in fiscal year 2022. Any expenditures associated with operating this new program would be negligible and could be absorbed within existing resources. Thank you. Uh, Representative Riley for a question. Uh, yes. Any other research or reviser, whoever's closest to a, a Kansas uh, statute menu, down on um, page six, Line 18, could you look up for me the Kansas State uh, 2020 Supplement 21-5417? I think the, the terminology that's in there, and I know that's been in there for a while, but of a vulnerable person, elderly person, or dependent adult, specifically an elder person, is that someone that is over 60? Um, is there a closer definition for that? Please, thank you. Mr. Chair, I can answer that if you'd like. Thank you, and please. Sorry, Goodbye I'm waiting for my computer to switch okay. screens here. Here we go. Um, the definition of a vulnerable person is, wow, um, going to be a dependent adult or elder person or an um, elder person being a person 60 years of age or older. That's correct, Representative Riley. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that feedback. That leads me to the question of the example perhaps the representative asked. Uh, my mother-in-law, who I'm trying to see whether this is under this statute or not, or this new this uh, revision, had a her and her husband, my father-in-law, had a condo that they bought. Uh, arm twisting, bought a condo in Missouri. And then they didn't use it for 10 years. And then they started getting calls from people saying, we can help you sell it. We can help you sell it. Give us $1,000, give us $2,000, give us $2,000, give us $4,000. We can get it sold for you. She never told anyone because she was so ashamed that she had been giving this person these thousands of dollars. We, the family never found out about this until uh, months later when the bank called us after all this money was secretly going out. And so then we filed a stack of papers, probably two inches high, to the Secretary of State about consumer fraud on this kind of thing. And they said, this happens all the time. And there's not much we can do for your mother-in-law but give us the paperwork. And we never heard another word on this. So is are we talking about this kind of securities kind of thing or what, we, I mean, is this relevant at all? Thank you. Uh, does the revisor have anything that would define securities if those are listed in traded securities? Um, Mr. Chair, securities violation is defined in the bill as a violation of the Kansas Uniform Securities Act. So depending on what exactly had transpired, if it would be considered a violation of the act, then it could perhaps be considered something that would be um, re restitution, uh, be awarded restitution. Um, but this bill would be prospective in nature, not retrospective in nature. So uh, in the case of Representative Riley's mother-in-law, this it probably would not address her case. But 
if the situation were similarly situated in the um, the 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 occurrence were a violation of the Securities Act, then by all means it would be something that might be that would be probably um, awarded restitution if the the application process were you know satisfactorily completed and and completed in a timely manner, etc. Thank you. We have two questions. One would be a question of timing, and the other would be a question of whether or not the real estate in question falls under the securities uh, law that's that's regulating. So, and uh, perhaps the insurance department will have some clarity for us on that as well. So, thank you. Uh, further questions, Representative Riley. Further questions, committee. Hearing none. Thanks for your attention to that and the detail through the fiscal note from both the reviser and the research office. And we'll move into our proponent testimony and would welcome Lee Modisett to the committee again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, Lee Modisett with the Kansas Insurance Department. Um, you have my uh, written testimony. I thought I might touch on a couple of um, this uh, items in here and then get to the specific questions that have been asked by uh, committee members. Um, if you look at um, the section related to um, the distinction between uh, 10 years if you're a victim of fraud in capers versus uh, five for all the others, uh, the purpose behind that is kind of twofold. Uh, one, from our perspective, uh, we didn't believe that we should be distinguishing uh, between victims of fraud and uh, because 10 years was already in the statute, seemed like having everybody on the same uh, level playing field was appropriate. Um, the purpose for this extension is actually along the lines of what Representative Riley was talking about early on. Um, the nature of building a fraud case, uh, there could be victims early on in the process who are um, for a number of reasons, um, uh, ashamed or afraid of coming forward. And as we get into that pro um, investigation, there could be um, early victims. In fact, we've had this situation where there are early victims who did not um, bring these issues to attention, all of that, and then we lose the timeline of kind of some of these uh, early losses. And those losses are important, not just from a uh, recovery standpoint, but also from ascertaining um, what level of fraud um, that the fraudster actually uh, committed. So that's the intent uh, there with, with the striking and making uh, that on an even playing field. The uh, issue dealing with the administrator, so this is uh, kind of a um, administrative efficiency 2017. I think most folks are aware um, at this point that the legislature put the securities uh, Office of the Securities Commissioner under the Insurance Department. Um, this is just further clarifying that if it's appropriate, it makes sense for our Assistant Insurance Commissioner um, to be the hearing officer, that they have that ability um, to conduct that hearing on behalf of the Commissioner. So just what that looks like from an office standpoint, uh, the Insurance Commissioner is, is the head of the department. Within that, we have two divisions. We have the Kansas Securities Commissioner, and then we have the, the Assistant Insurance Commissioner. In this case, um, our Assistant Commissioner is an attorney. Uh, we've not had any hearings um, related to the security side, but for our current structure, it just made sense to have uh, the ability to do that um, if if that sort of issue were to arise. Uh, the, the remainder of the bill deals with the establishment of the fund. Um, to Representative Dodson's uh, point it's, or question, it's actually quite difficult to ascertain on a, on a year by year basis um, how many folks fall victim to fraud because of the nature of the investigation, the length of time it takes to build the case, the number of times that uh, you, during this process you discover uh, new victims and amounts. I can tell you that uh, we have kind of informally tracked um, restitution since the 80s. And if you fall victim to fraud, the chances of, of actually recovering the amount of money that you've been ordered by the court to receive as restitution is less than 7%, which is quite an alarming statistic. So the, the purpose of this fund is to make some dollars available based on um, an individual circumstances. That's the two, um, two distinctions of, of dollar amounts. In most cases, it's in no way, shape, or form going to make 
folks whole. Um, this is only after uh, a court has ruled that there is restitution owed to you and that the fraudster has not uh, paid that restitution. There's a number of reasons uh, why restitution can be difficult to um, get from a fraudster. The first and foremost, obviously, being they're quite good at, at um, running and hiding and, and keeping uh, money unavailable um, for, for those purposes. So uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I'd be happy to stand for questions. Thank you for your testimony. Committee questions? Representative Miller. Well, just for clarification, the situation Representative Riley described might be consumer fraud, but it was not securities fraud. And I just want to make sure people know the difference. You're just talking about securities fraud, which is very limited. Uh, uh, great point, Rep Representative. Um, highly unlikely that there would have to be some sort of um, stock or investment in, in that particular real estate investment for there to have um, been a securities uh, element to it. Um, consumer fraud, when you step out of the securities um, space and investment fraud, you look more broadly. There's a lot of research that shows consumers nationwide will lose $50 billion annually to kind of all of these um, fraud schemes. And um, I, can, I can empathize with, this, with the story you're telling, have, have that uh, in, in my own uh, family with some in-laws. So. But un unfortunately, this this is only within our jurisdiction, the security statute. So yes, uh, Representative Miller, to your point, it's it's very narrow and tailored to to Securities Act violations. Thank you. Uh, I'll await further questions. But as I try and get a handle on it, just thinking how the money flows through, the money comes into the fee fund from what source? Who's paying into that fund? Uh, th thank you for the question, Mr. Chairman. The funds to the Securities Division come uh, through two primary sources, uh, the first of which is obviously industry paying through registration fees and things of that nature. And then um, throughout the year, we also, uh, if we find somebody violating uh, the Securities Act, there are different levels of fines um, that are levied uh, for those violations. Kind of all of that comes together. Uh, so this by statute, um, the Securities Division has a automatic uh, transfer to SGF um, at the end of the fiscal year uh, on an annual basis that averages around uh, $13 million a year. So we're proposing um, that we hold what we view as a relatively small portion of that transfer as seed money for the program. And then from there would, you know, try to appropriately and, and fiscally responsibly manage uh, that fund based on the number of victims that apply. Thank you. So the, the funds would come from industry, et cetera. And as I look to fraud or cases that, that may not have fraud, um, do, do some companies, do some entities stand behind? Are there some guarantee forms that I could say, oh, that would fall under this piece for someone to be able to get restitution? Well, I mean, a lot of the um, folks who fall victim, you know, in general, you're not dealing with um, what I'll call registered investment advisors working with uh, reputable companies. And so um, it's difficult for them um, to really stand behind a lot of the examples that, that we have here of they're, they're a security by definition, but they're not, um, the folks selling them are not acting, um, you know, within the rules and regs of, of offering it as a, secure, as a uh, licensed agent. So the, the direction that I'm kind of getting towards was be, if I am getting the money from the, the industry in, in form, and while they don't directly stand behind those because they make their clients whole, am I then indirectly having them stand behind these unregistered entities to say, well, I want you to help in making them whole. That's where I was trying to get sure. where that money might flow. Sure. That's, uh, that's an excellent question. So some of it comes from the registration. Some of it would be, you know, the, the fines are not as, um, the fines that we levy for bad actors are not, you know, as consistent. And so, um, you know, there, there is some uh, thought to the idea of, hey, I'm the, you know, I'm a uh, registered investment advisor. I do everything the way I'm supposed to. I pay my fees for um, the regulation. You know, why are they um, going to this when I'm not the one that defrauded um, an investor? I think the kind of the counter 
uh, viewpoint of that is these funds are already being transferred to SGF um, and not utilized in any way, shape, or form uh, for their original um, intent and purpose for why they were paid. Uh, I can't give a lot of details on it, but I think that's why um, there's a pending litigation uh, surrounding this um, transfer to SGF brought by um, agents in, in the profession feeling like, hey, we pay these fees for a well-regulated and well-balanced um, industry not to um, act as you know, additional uh, revenue for SGF. The department's not actually a party um, to that lawsuit. They're suing um, the state of Kansas because it's a statutory um, statutory language, but um, that's something that we're kind of uh, keeping an eye on and you know would evaluate, obviously, when the time comes. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Representative Proctor. Mr. Chairman, um, does this uh, statute also apply to insurance fraud, or uh, is that a subset of security fraud or in any way connected? Uh, that's a good question, Representative. So this is specific to uh, Securities Act, Chapter 17. So it would be tied specifically to um, in, uh, Securities Act violations and, and fraud related to that. Uh, insurance is in Chapter 40, and this doesn't uh, address that in any way, shape, or form. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Representative Riley. Uh, thank you, Lee. It just to clarify this, so does a client have to hire a attorney to sue the state, and so therefore there's attorney fees that it's paying back because of this? Uh, thank you for the question, Representative Riley. Uh, no, in this case, it would be um, our intent, should this bill become law, uh, would be to establish kind of an application process and, and guidelines. Um, the thing to, uh, that I probably should explain a little bit better is by the time we get to this point, our staff in the securities division has worked very closely um, with these victims to take their depositions, to get um, the information from, from them and, and get the documents that show they were in fact defrauded. So we're very familiar with um, these individual victims and, and what has happened to them in their life. And so this would be a scenario where they would just simply come to us and say, hey, here's my court ordered restitution. Um, the fraudster's not paying. We would look at that, verify that they have, in fact, not received any restitution, and then evaluate their particular application themselves. So this isn't a scenario where, you know, an attorney says, hey, I'll represent you pro bono, but I'm going to get X percentage. This would just be the individual applying for the restitution themselves. Thank you. Uh, continuing with the questions that I had on following it through, and I agree with the comment that the sweep from the fees are not something that would have been intended on that, but it sounds like it's registration and fines and other things that would come into the department. Um, the bill that we just passed, the licensing bill, what impact does that have on our total revenue to the department through that? Is that a decrease of a few million? Uh, uh, thank you for the question. The uh, licensing bill reduces um, revenue to the to the insurance side of the house by about five million annually um, on an ongoing basis. Um, but this would have that has no impact on this and, and vice versa. Great, good, good point. I should have known that going in. So thanks for walking no me through that. And uh, uh, say again, uh, I heard uh, the we, voice. we just have a question when you're done. Well, uh, we do. And uh, who should I recognize? Representative Howe. Representative Howe. Thank you, for, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Modestet, uh, you mentioned there is a pending uh, lawsuit between some agents against the state of Kansas uh, regarding this issue. Is the attorney general representing the state in that case, or has that gotten to that point yet? Uh, the attorney general's office is involved, but um, candidly, um, given that our department's not uh, party to that, I've kind of just kept tabs on it as a casual observer. So I can't, I can't tell you where in the in the process it's at. But it, yes, the Attorney General's office is involved. Okay, thank you. Further questions, committee? Representative Dodson.
Uh, thank you for the question. So it's specific to um, securities uh, as, as um, there are, you can be an insurance company or a bank or, you know, any number of uh, legal structure entities and have within, you know, those books of business, um, you could have an arm that deals um, with investments and securities. But the fund itself is specific to Securities Act violations. Mr. Chair, can we hear the question? The, uh, the second part deals with the uh, non-person felonies. Um, so class two, three, and beyond. Uh, when those recoveries are made, do those go to the general fund and can they be used to compensate those who have filed for these recoveries? Um, the the intent here, or the, the specifics of our uh, restitution is um, these have been, the restitution has been awarded in whatever situation that the court has ruled, and that has not been paid and appears to be not recoverable. So that's kind of what we're honing in here specifically on is the funds that are not recoverable, um, not anything that is recovered and able to be paid back. Thank you. Further questions, committee? Mr. Chairman, this is uh, Representative Proctor. Yes, Representative Proctor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, is there, I, I, this is a little bit outside of the bill, but is there a parallel insurance fraud restitution fund in statute? Uh, there, there is not. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Further questions? So I appreciate you walking me through the process of kind of where the money comes from, flows through, and to whom. Also appreciate the mention of the other states. Um, is there any bright spots that we could learn from Indiana or Montana or Vermont or uh, other places? Sure. Uh, thank you for that question. Interestingly enough, um, uh, NASA, which is the um, North American Securities Administrators Association, not to be confused with NASA, the, the space uh, in entity, but um, they are actually taking a look at this because, as I mentioned earlier, our recovery on restitution uh, is quite difficult, and that's not a problem um, unique to Kansas. So they've actually adopted um, model language that they are encouraging um, all other states to adopt related to this. It's modeled after... Um, the three states mentioned in my testimony, as well as um, our proposal uh, that we brought forward uh, last year and simply uh, ran out of time with. So um, we're kind of, uh, I think, in a good way at the forefront of um, this issue and trying to um, provide some level of, of relief uh, to Kansans. Again, it's certainly never going to make most investors whole. I was visiting with some of our securities attorneys today. I mean, they're uh, in one case, there are two victims who total, you know, $700,000 in losses. This is obviously never going to come close um, to touching that. Um, you know, going, it's a, you know, as uh, the revisor's office said, this is a going forward. You know, we had a question last year, why not go backwards um, and, and look back at a certain period of time? But um, kind of to the capers question uh, earlier, if you do that, you know, what, what's the cutoff? Um, where do you stop? And so um, our intent here and, and goal is to um, try to provide some level of relief uh, carrying forward. So thank you. And then trying to put all of those together, you know, from small to large. So if I had lost 700,000 and I'd get 25,000 back if I'm under 60, um, certainly would be a help to get something. But I'm trying to think, okay, if I had the wherewithal to make that investment, um, how, how much does it make from the state for me to get those dollars and trying to think through that? So that's just what's going on in my head. But to get to a question, I'll switch topics to the fact that you get to carry all the water on this since we don't have anyone either for or against uh, testifying. What have we heard from industry around this, either here or other places, that would uh, either excite us or tell us concerns that they might have with implementing it? 
Sure. So uh, what limited, um, you know, candidly, we've not heard a lot and what feedback we have uh, heard has been positive. Um, you know, I from our perspective and the folks we've talked to, um, I don't want to diminish, diminish um, uh, the real victims and the real impact that this has on their life. But from a legislative standpoint, this kind of feels like one of those feel-good bills that, that um, in our view, you know, is common sense and um, and makes good policy. Um, you know, certainly, um, you can always pick new dollar amounts. You know, there are large, you know, there are large victims and 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 smaller dollar victims based on their particular life circumstance, that is, um, you know, $5,000 may not be a lot to one investor, and it may be everything they have to another investor. And so striking that balance um, is what we're trying to do here with with the kind of these two separate categories and, and putting a cap on it, because it it is that balance between we don't have an unlimited amount of money, uh, but we also want to be mindful that um, different, you know, different victims have uh, different impact. Thank you. And you mentioned the feedback that you had was positive. Was that from industry or from investors or, or from where? Uh, uh, the few inv industry folks that um, had, had shared their comments back with us. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Other questions, committee? Representative Dodson. Kind of to follow up on uh, where I was going with the last question, are the people who have been defrauded uh, is their only solution through a private suit, or can they be joined by the state of Kansas who would find the, uh, let's say, the broker in violation of the Uniform uh, Securities Act? Uh, th thank you for the question. Unfortunately, most of the folks um, that are committing fraud um, are not um, what I would call the above board advisor. This is you know, a scenario where, um, you know, an, uh, an individual reaches out to 10 of their friends and says, hey, I want you to buy shares in my company. Um, and, you know, whether that's a classic Ponzi scheme or whatever the case may be. And so um, they have already been, the court has already ordered this restitution. And, um, you know, fortunately, unfortunately, um, some of these folks are able to put their money in, you know, their, your retirement accounts can't be touched. You have a primary residence that can't be touched. You have a vehicle that can't be touched. So they'll go serve their prison time. Um, but all their assets, uh, to no one's surprise, they're quite good at, you know, moving money around. And so that that's one of those. The, the first time I heard that seemed, you know, kind of a pound the table. This doesn't seem fair and doesn't seem right. Um, but it's the unfortunate um, reality of, that we have that um, right, wrong, or indifferent, you know, policymakers over years and years and years have decided that, you know, you still have your own right to a retirement and things like that. So these fraudsters are able to hide that money or completely avoid, um, you know, getting caught at all after they've um, served their time. And so that that's the... That's the issue that these victims have is that there's money they're owed, um, even with a collection agency. You know, you can't get blood from a turnip. Further questions, committee? Hearing none, thank you for your testimony. And this, despite my lengthy questioning, I appreciate the Securities Commission thinking of ways to be creative and uh, be at the forefront of various initiatives. Is there anyone else wishing to appear as a proponent on House Bill 2135? Is there anyone wishing to appear as an opponent on 2135? And anyone else at all, or neutral, I didn't get to neutral, on 2135? And anyone else at all on 2135? Hearing none, we will close the hearing. Thank you, committee. And that will bring us to our next item, which we will, uh, jump into House Bill 2136, if we could start with an overview from the reviser. Thank you, Mr. Chair. House Bill 2136 updates certain statutes relating to the regulation of the business of insurance and grants the Commissioner of Insurance certain investigational powers. Section 1 of the bill amends KSA 40-103, which is the statute that outlines the Commissioner's powers and duties. Under current law, the commissioner has the power to make investigations and examinations pertaining to complaints 
uh, pertaining to and related to insurance fraud and to investigate possible violations of the Kansas criminal statutes pertaining to and related to insurance fraud. Subsections B2 through B5 of the bill would grant the commissioner the ability to appoint investigators to aid in the investigations and examinations and in connection with such investigations and examinations, the power to subpoena witnesses, to compel the productions of production of books, records, and other documents, and to order that depositions be taken. Should an individual refuse to comply with a subpoena, the commissioner would not be able to take action on behalf of the department. The commissioner would be uh, required to apply to the district court for an order to enforce. Section 2 amends KSA 40-201A pertaining to the definition of service contract and when the issuance making an administration of a service contract is exempt from regulation as insurance. Current law states that the definition of service contract does not include an automobile club service as defined in KSA 40-2507. The bill would strike this provision because the bill also is repealing the Automobile Club Services Act. Section 3 amends KSA 2020 sub 40-246I, which is the statute that provides the definitions for the statutes regulating surplus lines insurance. Under current line, the net under current law, the net worth, annual revenue, and annual budgeted expenditure amounts that must be met by a person in order to be considered an exempt commercial purchaser must be adjusted every five years by the department through rules and regulations. The bill would change the requirement that the re requirement of rules and regulations be, I'm sorry, be changed to requiring that the adjusted amount be published every five years in the Kansas Register. Section 4 amends KSA 40-4,104 pertaining to the minimum non-forfeiture amount used to calculate minimum values of any paid-up annuity, cash surrender, or death benefits available under an annuity contract. So under current law, the interest rate used in determining minimum non-forfeiture amounts um, is an interest rate determined as the lesser of 3% per annum and the interest rate calculated as the five-year constant maturity treasury rate reported by the Federal Reserve as a date or average over a period rounded to the nearest 1 20th of 1% specified in the contract no longer than 15 months prior to the annuity contract's issue date or redetermination date reduced by 125 points, 125 basis points, where the resulting interest rate is not less than 1%. The bill would change the 1% interest rate that I just referred to to 0.15% or 15 basis points. Section 5 amends KSA 40-22A04 of the Utilization Review Organization Act pertaining to the conduct and certification of utilization review organizations. Under current law, the commissioner is required to adopt rules and regulations establishing the conduct of utilization review activities performed in the state with the advice of an advisory committee established by KSA 40-22A05. The bill would strike the requirement of using the advice of the advisory committee, and it would add healthcare providers to the type of utilization review activities requiring rules and regulations be adopted, establishing the conduct of such activities. Section 6 amends KSA 2020 SUP 22A05 of the Utilization Re Review Organization Act, which establishes the advisory committee that I just referred to in Section 5, and it lists exceptions to the Utilization Review Organization Act. The bill would strike the portion of the bill that creates that advisory committee. Section 7 of the bill amends KSA 2020 SUP 40-22A06 of the Utilization Review Organization Act, which specifies the exceptions to the certificate requirement for utilization review activities and states when certification provisions of the Utilization Review Organization Act are not applicable to certain organizations. Under current law, the provisions of KSA 40-22A04 
subsections B2 through B5 do not apply to utilization review organizations that are accredited by and that adhere to National Utilization Review Standards approved by the American Accreditation Healthcare Commission or other such utilization review organizations as the advisory committee might recommend and the commissioner approve. The bill would change the reference to the American Accreditation Healthcare Commission to the URAC and strike the reference to the advisory committee. Section 8 of the bill amends KSA 2020 sub 40-4103 pertaining to requirements that risk retention groups chartered in foreign states must observe. Under current law in subsection B1, a risk retention group seeking to do business in the state must submit a copy of the group's financial statement submitted to its state of domicile that is certified by an independent public accountant. The bill would strike the requirement that the financial statement statement be certified by such an in independent public accountant. Section 9 of the bill amends KSA 2020 SUP 44-1704 pertaining to the registration of professional employer organizations. And under current law in subsection E of the statute, a registrant must renew its registration by notifying the commissioner of any changes in the information provided in such registrant's most recent registration or renewal within 60 days of the end of the registrant's fiscal year. The bill would extend the 60-day time frame to 120 days. And under current law in subsection H, at the time of initial registration, the applicant must submit the most recent audit of the applicant or the applicant's parent company and the, the audit cannot be older than 13 months. Thereafter, a professional employer organization or the professional organization, I'm sorry, professional employer group um, must submit a succeeding audit within 60 days after the professional employer organizations or parent holding companies fiscal year. The bill would amend the 60 day time frame again to 120 days after the end of the professional employer organizations or the parent holding companies fiscal year. And finally, as I mentioned earlier, the bill repeals the Automobile Club Services Act. It's KSA 40-2501 through 40-2513. It's not a specific section of the bill. All you'll see is at the very end of the bill in the repealer section, you'll see that as also repealing and those statute numbers. And with that, Mr. Chair, I can stand for questions. For the overview, committee questions? Seeing none and double checking in the other room if we have any questions. Seeing none, thank you for the overview. Uh, might take just a moment for the fiscal notes submitted. If the research can take us through that. Ms. Rennick. Sure, thank you, Chairman Johnson. Committee members, as you will recall, Eileen mentioned in section one, there is an authorization for the commissioner to make investigation and examination. And that also could include um, appointing investigators to conduct investigations, subpoena witnesses, and compel them to testify, require documents, and order depositions. Because of that, the Division of the Budget sought consult from the judiciary and from both the League of Kansas Municipalities, as well as the Kansas Association of Counties. And the fiscal note uh, indicates that this could increase the number of cases that are filed in district courts because it would allow the bill, would allow the commissioner to apply to the courts to enforce compliance with subpoenas. This could in turn increase the time spent by the court, judicial and non-judicial personnel in processing, researching and hearing cases, and also could result in collection of additional docket fees and civil pen penalties. However, these additional expenditures and revenues could not be estimated at the time the fiscal note was submitted. In addition, the Association of Counties states that there could be some costs associated with servicing of subpoenas and other court activities, and the bill could also affect counties if there are costs associated with cooperating in investigations with the insurance department, but the court costs and fees that could be recovered um, to assist those additional costs, uh, there was no way a precise fiscal note could be provided. 
The League of Municipal Kansas Municipalities stated there would be no fiscal effect on cities. And that last provision that Eileen mentioned regarding the Automobile Club Services Act repeal, the insurance department indicates because automobile clubs would no longer be required to register with it, um, this would reduce revenues to the insurance department's service regulation fee fund by $33,670 annually beginning in fiscal year 22. And Mr. Chairman, those are the fiscal effects commented on in the fiscal note for this bill. Thank you for the overview committee questions. Seeing none, thank you for the information. That will move us to our proponent testimony and would welcome back Mr. Modest to the committee. Thank you for leading us through another topic. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Lee Modest at Kansas Insurance Department, uh, HB 2136. Uh, I know there's some questions on the uh, subpoena issue in particular, so I think I'll save that uh, to the end here and kind of go through um, the rest. So uh, uh, first of all, before I get too deep into this, I do want to say thank you, a big thank you uh, to the revisor's office, a bill draft that takes half a page just to talk about the sections um, that we're addressing uh, involved quite a bit of work um, from the revisor's office. So uh, appreciate that from Eileen. Uh, as, as she indicated, sections uh, 2 and 10 um, deal with repealing the uh, Auto Club uh, Services Act and registration. Um, essentially, long story short, at some point in time, this was added to, um, added to Chapter 40. Uh, we believe on uh, the idea that there was consumer protection related to um, registering these auto clubs. Um, the statute, as written, doesn't really address... Um, online auto clubs, which has become a, uh, quite prevalent. And so two years ago, we kind of got this question of does this registration uh, require online only um, auto clubs to register with Kansas? We really started looking into this issue and felt like uh, there's no uh, real consumer protection here, uh, purpose behind uh, requiring um, the registration. Uh, there are a number of, of clubs that are available online, most of them offering some sort of uh, discount program or, or what have you. Um, AAA is kind of the, the go-to example of, a, of an auto club, not the insurance side of their house. This does not get rid of all of those uh, requirements for them to be a uh, solvent insurer. But on the club registration itself is, is what we're um, proposing to eliminate there. Again, doesn't really from our perspective, make a lot of sense to continue um, to offer, kind of outlived its usefulness. Um, that we do bring in a, uh, on a every other year basis around uh, $33,000. So that would be a, a revenue reduction um, to the department. Um, sections, uh, section three relates to excess lines and taxes. Um, the issue there is that in statute, the formula is actually already spelled out. And so it's instructing us to adopt a predefined formula via rules and regs, as I'm sure you all are familiar with, you know, rules and regs book, uh, it's about 100 pages. Um, didn't really make sense to us to go through the rules and regs process when the formula is already spelled out in statute. Um, so we're proposing to uh, simply publish that in the Kansas Register. It's a, it's a rate that uh, updates every five years, but there's no real uh, rule or reg um, to adopt because it's already um, defined in statute for us. Um, let's see, section uh, four uh, deals with um, the adjustment to non-forfeiture rate on annuities. Um, the purpose for this, uh, the 1% that is um, listed in there as part of the NAIC um, model law related to annuities. There was discussion uh, late last year, given the low interest uh, rate environment, about concern um, for the uh, offering of new annuities, that um, that floor uh, may pose a problem uh, for some folks um, in the market. So. Um, the decision at the NAIC was to propose to, to lower that. Um, they considered anything from 0.45 to all the way to zero and then settled at, at 15 basis points. 
Two things on that um, that I want to be perfectly clear on. This is a floor. It's not a ceiling. Uh, we believe that there will continue to be uh, competition in the marketplace to, to get a better uh, return uh, for um, those who would like to purchase an annuity. And this does not make any changes to um, existing uh, annuity contracts. So uh, that's the proposed change there. Uh, section uh, 5, 6, and 7 deal with the uh, repealing of the a utilization uh, review committee. Uh, for some brief background and kind of how we arrived here, uh, by statute, we're required to appoint members uh, to this committee. Uh, the committee has not met. Uh, there's a small typo in my uh, prepared testimony said since 2013, but it's actually 2015. So the commission, uh, this committee has not met um, since then. Uh, there are vacancies. And when the commissioners started making calls, asking folks if they would serve on this, they naturally said, what does this involve? Hey, nothing, they haven't met in six years. And that really kind of got us to thinking, what's the purpose of having this um, on the books uh, if, there, if there is no real uh, reason to meet? And the utilization review is, is largely handled uh, through URAC, um, which is a utilization review uh, accreditation uh, committee. So this is kind of one of those examples in our view where um, this has outlived its usefulness and purpose uh, for being in statute um, and no longer uh, needed to be on the books. So that's what we're proposing there. Um, and then the remainder of moving the audited financials from 60 days to 120 days, this is a, a process improvement from our perspective. Um, uh, we would get requests. The audited financials are due to us within 60 days for a number of reasons. That's not really practical. We usually get requests to extend that, and it ultimately ends up being 120 days anyway. So rather than um, having to go through that process where the uh, and where the company has to make that request and we have to spend staff time approving it, simply moving that out to better align uh, with financials. And then lastly, back to the first section of the bill, uh, dealing with subpoena authority. Uh, from our perspective, uh, this is really simply a process improvement. This does not um, uh, dramatically expand our authority in any way, shape, or form. This is still related to Chapter 40 um, and conducting investigations, um, trying to, uh, there's a lot of, been a lot of questions about insurance fraud, trying to reduce that. I've been asked for some examples of what we may be looking at. Um, so a couple of things that are in the bill just for uh, kind of example purposes. If we get a uh, consumer complaint or um, a referral from an uh, insurance company and there's a belief that fraud may have been committed, there are entities uh, that are already in our jurisdiction. That's not who we're talking about. We're not talking about the company, the insurance company. We're not talking about the consumer complaint, but there may be a towing company um, that has a tow record that would be valuable to conducting that investigation. There may be a body shop that would have records of documenting the condition of the car at, move, uh, at the time that it you know, was brought into the, into the shop. Those entities are not subject to our jurisdiction, and they may have information that can help us um, aid in that investigation in trying to determine uh, whether or not fraud or, or some other criminal activity um, had taken place. There was a question I got about um, subpoenaing these records from other states. So a great example of that would be if I'm a Kansas driver with a Kansas company, but I have an accident in Missouri and a Missouri tow company tows my vehicle to the nearest um, tow yard. Um, that would be a situation where uh, an entity outside of the state of Kansas uh, would have information that can um, assist us in our investigation. We have that um, happens to us all the time as well. So um, again, from our perspective, this is a, a process improvement. Um, we already uh, worked with the Attorney General's office um, on subpoenas. So from our, from our point of view, um, instead of having two agencies deal with uh, issuing this for the purposes of being able to do what we're tasked with doing in Chapter 40, um, this gets us uh, kind of right to the matter quicker. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, if there is an entity um, that does not like our subpoena, we can't do anything about it other than going to court and asking the court to enforce that subpoena. So um, those that are getting the subpoena would still have the right to tell us buzz off. So, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd be happy to stand for questions. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Committee questions? And who, who do we have in the other room? 
Collins, Representative Collins. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. My microphone is not working here, so I'd like to thank uh, Representative Proctor for sharing. <laughs> but uh, you mentioned the uh, uh, Commissioner of Insurance would have more investigative powers. I was just wondering, and you did mention enforcement as well, but uh, uh, prosecution, is, uh, do you have attorneys who prosecute that, or does the uh, attorney general or the local county or district attorney? Uh, thank you for the question, Representative Collins. So we're not uh, seeking, uh, nor would we want to seek prosecutorial powers here. This is solely on administrative subpoena. So as we're building our case and we work with the attorney general's office, in fact, you may have seen in the, the news just a week or two ago, there was an individual who was charged with $85,000 in fraudulent activity and insurance. So at the end of the day, once we've built our case, uh, the commissioner likes to say we've handed it to the attorney general on a silver platter and they get to take all the credit for all of our hard work. All right. Thank you very much. Other questions? And it was good to see the whole room there for a moment. Uh, Representative Proctor, did you have a question? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mike, I got a couple questions if I could. The first one, uh, on the investigative powers in uh, Section 1, um, does the do those investigating powers on insurance fraud extend to unemployment insurance? Uh, thank you for the question. They would not because um, unemployment insurance is not under our jurisdiction. Thank you for that answer. And then the, the other question is, and I believe it's Section 4, uh, where you're talking about the uh, uh, minimums on uh, death benefits. Um, is CAPERS e uh, exempt from those requirements in the statute? Uh, section, so dealing with the, this is the floor for the annuity? I, yeah, I believe there's like a, a section of it that talked about death benefits. Um, yeah, uh, so I guess the, the generalized question is, uh, are, is CAPERS in any way connected to these requirements or this, this uh, change to the statute? Um, I, I hesitate to give a def definitive answer, but the, um, uh, CAPERS does not fall within us. So is it theoretically possible that CAPERS would want to invest in some sort of annuity product uh, that this would be connected to? I guess that's con conceivably possible, but um, uh, I, do, I do not believe that CAPERS would be impacted by this in any way. Yeah, the, the, I guess the, the bill brief when it talks about uh, cash surrender and death benefits. That, that's why I thought there might be a connection. So I would like to kind of have a more definitive answer of if sure. somebody could come back later and sue capers based on the statute saying that we're not hitting some floor. Other questions, committee? Mr. Chair? Yes. Hi, it's Eileen. May I answer the representative's question? Please. Thank you. Um, the statute just pertains to the, the amendment in the statute just pertains to how we're going to calculate the minimum non forfeiture amount. And that in turn is used to calculate the minimum. Um, I lost my place here. The minimum. Um, do, 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 do. Hold on. I completely lost my mind. The um, minimum value of certain paid annuities, and of those paid up annuities, um, their their paid up annuities, cash surrenders, or death benefits available under an annuity contract. It's not anything to do with capers. It's just a type of product that uses minimum values by which the minimum non-forfeiture amount is used to calculate that value. So very broadly, it has nothing to do specifically with CAPERS. It has to do with a number that's used to calculate something else. If that helps. Thanks for the information, and information always either helps or further confuses us. So uh, we, we have those. I'm hoping that helps. <laughs> yes, so, so thank you. 
Um, on on the one percent, it then, then does not apply to like the minimum require or minimum guarantee on a fixed account within an annuity that's a deferred annuity. It would just be those non forfeiture correct rates. And um, we are are we currently at one or? Yeah, the the current is one, and the concern um, from uh, folks at the NAIC was that. Uh, uh, corp, uh, kind of those bond rates are below uh, 1% at the moment. And so um, while it's hard for me to envision a scenario in which a consumer would buy an annuity with a point, you know, 1.5% return, um, I guess it's conceivably possible. Um, I mean, kind of from a, I th candidly, I think this is some idea of, of consumer protection. I mean, I, I would hope that a consumer would never buy an annuity with a 0% um, I, you know, it's always possible, of course, but, um, so the, the, that's the, to reiterate, that's the floor, not the, not the ceiling. So it is for a newly purchased annuity. If I am taking some settlement on an existing annuity that would not apply, it would be the rules to the contract. Correct. Correct. Yep. And I'm still not sure I know exactly what annuity I would buy, uh, to get that, but I'll, I'll try and get on top of that myself. I am curious, um, again, other states, are we uh, moving down somewhat in lockstep because companies are gonna design products that fit across states as well? Uh, correct, Mr. Chairman. The, the, cons the concern was that there's a theoretical possibility that if the uh, reduction in basis didn't happen, that companies may choose not to offer uh, new annuities going forward. Um, again, it's difficult for me as well to wrap my head around uh, where that um, would come into be, but um, this was voted on, I believe, in December um, by the executive committee, and so it's um, kind of every state, whether that be, you know, ours is in statute, others may be in reg, but kind of every state is, is taking a look at that because of this low interest environment. Was it NAIC? Uh, correct. That had done this. So their guidance is what states are then following to try to be uniform for the industry. Correct, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you for that. Um, in Section 8 that related to the independent public accountant uh, doing the, uh, the review, so we have that, when we get somebody coming in without that, how are we reviewing those numbers then? They're still going to submit the um, financial statement. Um, it's this is um, simply eliminating that kind of um, extra step. So we're still going to look at um, the the financial statements are still going to be looked at and ensure solvency and consumer protection in that regard. So we're able to review the statements and have the ability to do that. Is the thought of what was used for the independent public accountant just to make sure that we were getting good data to start with to review? And is there anything that we give up in that process? I, I actually like the idea of anything that we can do less of. So that's the right direction. I just wanted to make sure I had a handle on it. Yeah, from our perspective, this is um, something that um, adds uh, some level of um, expense to preparation, but does not really um, give any additional uh, confidence uh, to the to the data. We don't have any reason to believe that uh, the remainder of the report would would not be sufficient um, for review. Thank you. Further questions, committee? Or because it's now 507, folks are slowing down. Representative Croft. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, be real quick uh, question for you. So, under the current law, it grants the commissioner um, supervision, control, supervision, yeah, contr and control over entities authorized to transact the business of insurance, indemnity, and, and boy, I can't pronounce what I wrote down in the state. This bill, though, seems to give you some greater authority over any entity registered or licensed in a state, not limited to. Uh, insurers and even insurance. Is, that, is this really what you were after? Uh, thank you for the thank you for the question. So, uh, what well, again to my kind of earlier um, reference? There may be, uh, you know, for instance, a bank may have bank records that uh, will assist us in our um, investigation of whether or not an individual has committed insurance fraud. We don't regulate that bank. The bank is a separate regulated entity, but. 
we can we can send an you know a, for lack of a better way of describing it we can send an email request that says you know hey we believe that this individual may have committed um, insurance fraud can you provide you know those bank records they're not going to give that to us uh, without some sort of subpoena and formalizing um, that investigation so the the key here is is that we can't just go ask any entity um, for our own grins and giggles for information it has to be connected and tied to our investigations and the authority and and the instructions that we've been given by the legislature through you know over the years um, in chapter 40. so uh, you know a, a good, I think a good example would be you know let's say there's a direct primary care physician who is um, advertising some sort of service or product um, that may uh, we may get a complaint that says hey we feel like this is uh, inappropriate they shouldn't be charging that much well there's no insurance payment in a direct primary care model that may be a consumer protection issue at the AG but we're not going to be able to just go to that DPC and say give us all your documents and records because we don't have a chapter 40 connection so this is all um, tied to and, and spelled out in chapter 40 in our view of um, our ability to conduct the investigations in trying to determine whether or not a uh, violation of the chapter 40 took place okay thank you uh, but as you were talking about that you're talking about uh, I think I've heard you say complaints or information how do how do you define a complaint is it a phone call or is it this what do they have to do to, for it to become an official complaint for you to have to go after that yeah, I mean, we, in order for us to have a reason to um, subpoena uh, records, we would have to have uh, some other uh, reasonable basis for belief that a crime or a potential crime had been committed. And so, you know, you can't just call our office and say, hey, I think these, uh, you know, I think XYZ business down the street's committing insurance fraud. And we're not going to be able to just, you know, bring a subpoena and say, hey, you know, hearsay, we think that you're committing insurance fraud. We have to have some other supporting documentation. Because the thing to keep in mind is that this is an administrative subpoena. So if whoever we are subpoenaing documents for, if they tell us, hey, I don't think so, we have to then go to court to actually enforce that subpoena. We have no enforcement power if they tell us that they're not going to comply. So we have to, when we prepare that subpoena, have supporting documentation, knowing that if we subpoena them and they don't comply, we have to make the case um, to a judge. And then all of this fits under the whole piece of building a case to turn over to the attorney general if, if, you know, if it gets to that point. So on that, I noticed in there you also say a violation for, of the subpoena, right? Is a two thousand dollar for each offense. So what's each offense mean? Be a violation of the subpoena. So it's you know if there's a thousand documents, and I'm you know obviously throwing out a wild number for Great question. Yeah, for for you know example purposes more than anything, if there's a thousand documents that we've requested and they don't turn turn them over under one subpoena, it's not two thousand dollars times the thousand documents. It's it would be a two thousand dollar fine. For that one subpoena that contains all of those other requests. Okay. And then just one last final thing. Sure. So, um, would would this not be better under some kind of fact finding authority rather than a subpoena process? Well, I would say that. Is there uh, any other choices to you than this? That's why I'm, that's really what I'm asking. Sure. Um, you know, I would say that our council uh, worked in conjunction with the revisor's office um, to draft this language based on um, the sorts of things that we see on a day-to-day -day basis and uh, the issues that we're that we're trying to get at. So, from the department's perspective, this is the appropriate way to try to um, conduct those things that we are tasked with in Chapter 40. I have about 20 other questions. I'll wait and talk to him on the side so sure. I don't get uh, throttled by everybody else here, if that's okay, <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Other questions, committee? I, I might hold this up with one more, and that would be uh, the Securities Commission currently has something like this or not like this, and how might this be similar or different? Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes. Uh, Failed to mention the leg kind of legislative history. So uh, last year we actually brought um, this uh, similar language. Uh, the only difference was we had actually added a, a law enforcement component um, to it. And the and the thought process was, and 
at the time that we have an anti-fraud division in insurance and we have a, an enforcement and compliance division um, within the securities um, division and we are tasked with cross-training and with uh, administrative efficiency. We heard from a number of folks uh, on the insurance side of, hey, you know, this is the same uh, white collar stuff that maybe you see on the security side. Uh, we have some concern about that. When we had internal discussions, um, we, we took a look at it and said, hey, we think we can actually um, get at the issues we're trying to get at without that. So we brought it back uh, with different language, which took that, um, that piece out. Um, the only, um, there is some language from the securities um, section of our statute that makes it makes it even clearer that you have the right to, um, you know, petition before court um, for to not enforce. Uh, we believe that's inferred here again because ultimately we would have to go to court to enforce the subpoena if an individual or entity were to um, not comply. And so. Um, We've had questions about whether or not we would consider adding that language in. If that uh, alleviated heartburn, we'd be happy to do that. We're not, I wanna be perfectly clear that we're not trying to step on anybody's right to due process and uh, trample on their uh, constitutional rights. We're simply looking for a better way to do the things that we are tasked to do in chapter 40. So uh, just to, to I, I'm sure that you more than answered my question, but because I'm a little slow, um, Securities would have subpoena power currently, and insurance would not in perhaps similar cases that they might be addressing? Uh, the securities division has direct subpoena power now. The insurance side of the house has to work in conjunction with the attorney general's office. Thank you. Other questions, committee? Seeing none, um, Thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, offline, I may follow up if there was a third-party administrator piece that we wanted to discuss, but we may do that next meeting if that is appropriate for the department. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is there anyone else wishing to appear as a proponent for 2136? Hearing none. Anyone wishing to appear opponent? Neutral. Anyone at all on 2136? And seeing none, we will close the hearing. Thank you for your patience, committee. We're adjourned and we'll see you on Wednesday.